Hello, True Health Seekers, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. Today's episode is fantastic. It's something that all of us need to learn, and it's something that everyone does. So it applies to literally everyone. But before we get started on the episode, today is contest day. So exciting. Thank you so much, everyone, for your fantastic support. Uh, The contest, in case you didn't know, was if you left a five-star rating or review in iTunes, of course, if you believe you deserve it, then leave one, please. We really appreciate it. And also, it helps promote the podcast so more people can learn this fantastic holistic health information. So you, by leaving a five-star review, are actually helping others to find us on iTunes and get their health back as well. So it's the ripple effect. So thank you so much for that really appreciate it and for those that did got entered into the contest and I have all of your names here I don't know if you can hear it in this big box and I'm shaking it up and we're gonna do a live drawing right now for one of you the one uh, the of you who left the review so thank you so here let me oh wait let me shake it up okay my husband's gonna I'm going gonna I'm gonna draw it all right, which one is it? Number eight. Number eight is Allison Rosen. Allison, thank you so much. I'm going to be uh, emailing you uh, so I can get your mailing address. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, participating in the contest. It was a lot of fun. I'm going to be sending out Allison. I'm going to send out your uh, gift box of goodies. And if you uh, would like to enter into the next contest, I haven't figured out which it's going to be yet, um, but it'll be fun or whatever it is. Um, and you are leaving a five star review on iTunes, go ahead and email me, Ashley at Learn True Health, and let me know. Just give me your name and let me know you did so I can enter you into the next uh, fun contest, which I gotta figure out what it is. But anyways, um, have a fantastic day and enjoy this information. We have Dr. Heidi Samani coming back on the podcast to teach you about a specific part of digestion that is very, very important. So I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Are you looking to optimize your health? Are you looking to get the best supplements at the lowest price? For high quality supplements and to talk to someone about what supplements are best for you, go to takeyoursupplements.com and one of our fantastic true health coaches will help you pick out the right supplements for you that are the highest quality and the best price. That's takeyoursupplements.com. Takeyoursupplements.com. That's takeyoursupplements.com. Be sure to ask about free shipping and our awesome referral program. Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 28. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Heidi Samani. It's great to have you back. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Dr. Heidi Samani was um, episode two, I believe. I think so, yeah. Dr. Heidi Samani, we talked about in the first episode that we had you here, about how as a paramedic you helped in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Yes, we did. Which um, was amazing. If you haven't listened to episode two, go back and listen. And uh, I talk more about her credentials and her her background. Uh, So we'll skip that this time. But she is a naturopathic doctor, very awesome naturopathic physician. And uh, she's been practicing for over five years or around five years. Um, But before that, she was a paramedic. So she's had a long understanding of the human body and how it works. And what I love about Dr. Heidi is that she's not um, high up on a pedestal. Um, She (laughs) is human, just like all of us. She has flaws and she struggles with everything we struggle with, like um, eating right and exercise. And uh, but she has the compassion for all of us who want to be healthy because we're all on a health journey together. Yeah, we are. Yes. And so today we're going to talk about something very human that we all have. I guarantee that you do this at least once a week. Hopefully, hopefully once a day. Hopefully three times a day. <laughs> today we're going to talk about your poop. Yes, we are. Yes. 
My poop, your poop, everyone's poop. Everyone poops. In fact, I think we'll even talk about the perfect poop. The perfect poop. This is, and this is part of optimal health, isn't it? It is. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show, and I'm really excited that you're going to be teaching us about the perfect poop and how to know that we're having the perfect poop. So, well, let's first talk about like why. Why? Why do we need to care about our poop? Why should we care about our poop? Because it's a really good diagnostic determinant without ever having to go to the doctor. You can kind of get a baseline of how your digestive system is working. Our poop gives us a lot of information. And it's something that takes up a lot of our attention. Most of our guts are lined with nervous tissue. And so pooping appropriately or not pooping can change the nervous tone of your body, which can also say you are constipated, right? We've all heard the term, you know, that person's so stuck up or... You know, they got to stick up their butt, they constipated, you know, anal retentive. Those terms all refer to somebody who has a personality that is tightly wound or anxious. And what we're learning now in our research is that because the gut is so involved with the nervous system that how often you poop truly does affect your mood and your general well-being. Wow. So do you think people who are anxious or depressed might have not healthy poop patterns? It's possible and it's definitely worth exploring. So hopefully today we can get you some information about what the perfect poop looks like so you know if it's contributing to your health issues. Awesome, well, every ND I have interviewed on this show has told me either on air or off air that all, like in the 90% range, their patients do not have healthy poops. Absolutely. It, it's, I mean, it's crazy, or they think they do, yeah, and then they fi come to find that, oh, pooping once a week isn't healthy, Yes. Um, or pooping every three days isn't healthy. Well, the Western medical model is based on averages, so without assigning a pathology to something, we just take a look at the world, see how people tend to do it, and then we take a middle number for you. So it is in the literature that a bowel movement, you know, once or twice a week is within the normal parameters. Oh my gosh. Right. When we think more thoroughly about the digestive system and its purpose and its process, you recognize that having a backup for any length of time slows down the rest of the processes, the digestion, the absorption of nutrients. So all of the things that lead to health and wellness, if you have a slowdown in your digestive system, if you have a slowdown in your poop process, then you're not able to assimilate as well as you could if that were emptied out regularly. I saw this in my mother. Um, she passed away of liver cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, and I saw this in her that um, she was on laxatives, um, and I didn't understand why. And the, the doctors basically said we have to keep her moving. We have to keep her moving um, because the liver is getting out, getting toxins out of the body. And um, it came to a point where she uh, ceased to take any medications, and she she personally decided to stop doing it. And when she's decided to stop taking the um, laxative, she got backed up and she, her jaundice went through the roof. And I saw that, the relationship between just how many bowel movements you can have a day and your liver health. Yes. Um, so it's, it was amazing. I didn't, I didn't, I'd never realized how sensitive our body was that, you know, your liver is dumping toxins and trying to get rid of toxins and, and it dumps it into the, into the small intestines through the gallbladder, right? Right, so what some people might be struggling with is how did we jump from liver to poop and how does that change the color of your skin? And most of us, when we look at our poop, we assume it's going to be one color and that's brown. But most of the variances come into shades of yellow and green. And the reason for that is that poop has a product in it called bile or gall. And these come from your liver and your liver makes bile for a couple different purposes. It serves to emulsify fat, so help you break down your fat products, but it also is a way to get rid of toxins. So your liver is a huge organ so far as what it does in its jobs. And one of the many jobs is to help remove toxins from the body. Now these are not just the typical things you think of like heavy metals or environmental toxins. This is also the natural breakdown products of your own hormones, your endogenous system, how your body runs. So testosterone, estrogen, epinephrine, adrenaline, all of these things need to be broken down somehow. And that's the job of the liver. And so the liver uses bile, which is a yellow colored substance. In concentration, it's green or brown and once it's mixed with poop. But the liver uses this to help get the toxins out of the liver and out of the body. 
So we've talked about urine as a way of relieving the body, as a way of detoxifying. You need to pee out things, but people don't think about how much you need to poop out things. So the bile is a way for the body to transmit their toxins, break down products into the large intestine, small intestine, then large intestine so that it can exit the body healthily. And if we slow down that system, you know, say you're constipated and you don't poop for a couple of days, your liver doesn't stop doing its job. It continues to break down foods, fats, and help your body process everything that you're putting in. It continues to make bile and it continues to pump that into your digestive tract. So if it's not going out, where is it going to go? Your body will reabsorb those products. So your liver did such great work and got all those toxins into the bile. Your body processed it through and it's sitting in your large intestine. And your large intestine likes to absorb the water out of things. It likes to take the moisture out of things. So if something sits in the large intestine too long, it'll get sucked dry, which means all of those lovely toxins are going to find their way back into your bloodstream. Ugh. I, I read somewhere that um, the large intestine absorbs like 70% of our water intake. Yes. I mean, that's amazing. It really is. When the food you chew, right, you think about the the texture of food as it's passing through your throat and you think, okay, cool, when it gets to the stomach, it's gonna have some acid added to it. That makes sense. And it's gonna break down further. So by the time it gets into your small intestine, it's mostly a liquid. And so when it enters your large intestine, people think, oh, it's poop now. And it's really not. It's still that pretty thick liquid. And so the large intestine is responsible for mostly um, water absorption, but also some electrolyte transfer and other things as well, but yes. A majority of the water that you use comes from your poop. And so you want to obviously have it be moving and not be constipated, otherwise then you're immediately dehydrated. Right, so there's a two-way street here with hydration and how often you poop. If you don't poop often enough, your body will take the water it needs out of the product that is sitting in your large intestine. Making it harder and harder to poop. Make it harder to poop. There you go. So maintaining your hydration is hitting it from the front end. If you stay hydrated adequately, you allow there to be enough movement and passage for the poop out of your large intestine. So there's a difference between a transit time issue and then also the content of what's moving through. So constipation can be a two-part problem. Sometimes it's a blockage problem and then sometimes it's just it's not fluid enough to move through. Got it. So step one, if you're constipated, drink more water. Yes. Okay, and we did a great episode, uh, Dr. Molly Niedermeyer, um, at the top of my head, I think it was episode five, where she talked about how much water to drink based on body weight, so go listen to that formula. Um, it's a fantastic formula for knowing how much to drink. So essentially, drink that much water, and if someone still has constipation after consuming enough water for several days, uh, then what's the next step? There's a lot of things to think about, of course, making sure that the intestines are actually moving. Some people don't poop because they're taking medications that cause the nerves in the intestine to be dulled. So if you're on opioid pain medications and a few other medications, it may interrupt the signals from your nervous system telling your large intestine to evacuate, to let loose, so that the poop then stays in large intestine too long, becomes more dehydrated, and then you continue that cycle of making it harder and harder to pass. So in those cases, we may need to do more extraordinary measures. But for the typical person who's not on a medication who's affecting their bowel movements, we would take our next step, which would be to introduce fiber-rich foods. So stool needs to have a couple different things. It needs water, but it also needs bulk. So the way our intestines work, if you put your hands together side by side and imagine squishing from one end to the other like you would a water snake or if you were kneading dough, then you can imagine the movement of your intestines, which is called peristalsis. And if that movement happens in that nice wave-like form, it's going to be pushing things along. If it's liquid, it's going to go in both directions because liquid cannot, it's very difficult to control liquid unidirectionally with a wave flow pattern. But if there's enough bulk to it, if we have fiber-rich poop, then it's easier for those muscles to be signaled that it's the appropriate time to squeeze. So having enough bulk in your poop, it signals your intestines to squeeze, and that mechanical squeezing, that peristalsis, keeps its rhythm better. I've heard Dr. Wallach say to eat one organic apple a day because it has both soluble and insoluble fiber. Mm -hmm. So eat an organic apple a day with the peel, what, else, what other foods should um, people consider 
adding to their diet, of course, organic as much as possible. Right, well, apples are great for you. With their skin, a medium apple has about 4.4 total grams of fiber. Now, there's very few fruits that come in ahead of that, and they would be pear with skin or raspberry. So an apple with skin would have about 4.4 grams of total fiber in it. And other foods that you would consider that are also fruit that are high in fiber would be pear with skin or raspberries. Now, we said an apple a day has about 4.4 grams of fiber. Well, how is one apple a day enough when the body's requirement is at least 25 grams of fiber 25. a day? 25. Yes. Wow. So while that apple is a wonderful start and it is moving us in the right direction, what the body needs is probably a lot more food, vegetables typically, containing fiber to help with assimilation. So an apple is a good start, but you have about five apples, I think, would <laughs> add up to an appropriate amount of fiber for a typical person. The need for fiber is a little bit different between men and women. Men tend to need just a little bit more fiber in their diet. So if the average adult woman needs about 25, 28 grams of fiber, the average male needs about 38. And that's true for us right up through late adulthood. So until you're in your 50s or 60s, it's reasonable to have between 20 and 30 grams of fiber per day as a female and over 30 as a man. Wow, we need to make some serious changes. Well, the good news is there are tons of food that are extremely packed with fiber. Now, something that most of us may have experience with, if you are somebody who eats grains, you may have heard that oat bran is rich in fiber. And oat bran for one ounce has 12 grams of fiber in it. So a serving of oat bran with an apple and you've just about reached your need for fiber for the day. So that's why a lot of doctors, when they're counseling about cholesterol and getting good bowel movements, will recommend oatmeal as a part of the day. Um, other foods that are wonderful for fiber are beans. So adzuki beans, a cup of cooked adzuki beans have 17 grams of fiber. Oh, wow. A more common bean, a lima bean, 14 grams of fiber. And then you go down to black beans even, which are really common, especially if you enjoy Spanish food, and that's 15 grams of fiber per serving, so per one cup of cooked bean. So, you know, if you're not into beans and you're not eating grains, what else could you do? How might you be able to get more fiber, say, into your kids? Well, we talked apples, pears, and raspberries, but all berries really have between 3 and 10 grams of fiber in them. Um, elderberries are one of the richest if you enjoy elderberry. So another food group to consider would be peas if you're looking to increase your fiber. Um, cow peas or black eyed peas are about 11 grams of fiber per serving. And split peas, which are what we usually make our split pea soup out of, right? 16 grams of fiber per cup. So you have other choices. Squash is rich. Squash is another one that's really great for high fiber if you like acorn squash. So with squash, the richer the color of the squash, usually the more fiber content it has. So your oh. lighter squashes like spaghetti squash or summer squash have three to five grams. You get into the deeper colors, the butternut and the acorn, you get higher. Okay, so darker the squash, the better the poop. Yes, so there you go. And now if none of those vegetables and fruits interest you at all, you can always consider nuts as a source for fiber. The best nuts would be pinion nuts or pine nuts, but you can follow that up with almonds are good too and flaxseed. Do you have any info on uh, chia seeds? Chia seeds, I don't have it in front of me, but chia seeds tend to come up very similar to flaxseed with about eight or so grams per, per ounce. And with chia seeds, um, flaxseed, we recommend using fresh ground. So you get your flax seeds whole, you grind them yourself. That way you're getting both the fiber and the oils from them. But with chia seeds, I actually usually make a different recommendation. I tell people to soak them first mm -hmm. in whatever liquid you prefer. Some people like to use juice. Some people use almond milk. I use water. And then you use the hydrated chia seeds. So when the chia seed's hydrated, it gets this nice little jelly coat over it. And for me, this is a great constipation answer because you have a hydrated fiber yeah. that now you're contributing both to the water content and the fiber content of the poop. It's kind of like tapioca or like um, bubble tea. Yeah, it does have that texture. So most people, if they're not into the crunchy, will enjoy it if it's soaked. Mm. So that's the way I do it. I also can get people usually to eat what I call chia seed pudding. So that's where the almond milk comes in. And so a little bit of you soak the seeds in double their mass of milk and add a little bit of honey, a little bit of cinnamon, and it becomes like a breakfast treat like oatmeal 
except without the potential allergens. So like a gluten-free oatmeal. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Fantastic. My mom had a coffee grinder just for um, our flax seeds yeah. when we were growing up. Uh, so Dr. Diadamo was our naturopath when I was six years old, and he got us onto every morning, like clockwork, she would um, juice a couple uh, grapefruits and do his some kind of his protein shake, which I don't even remember what was in it, but it was really high in fiber, and then grind a couple uh, tablespoons of flax and mix that all together with a probiotic um, and that's what she served up to the family. It was like a protein, high um, fiber protein shake that the entire family ate for breakfast. And if you left it too long, it would like congeal yeah. <laughs> because of the flaxseed. Um, but after that, we had com like very regular bowel movements. Yes. <laughs> As a kid growing up, it's like I, I didn't think about my poop. But luckily, I had a naturopath thinking about it for me. And I had my mom cook, making that um, little fiber drink every morning. And so I just remembered that when you mentioned the grinding the flax. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can go to the, you know, anywhere to buy a cheap um, coffee grinder and just have your own coffee grinder set aside for your flax seed. True. Cool. Awesome. Well, so we've got some good foods to think about. Right. So we said if you are drinking adequate amounts of water and you've added fiber into your diet and you're not on a medicine that would change your bowel habits, the next thing to consider is if there's enough fat in your diet. Really? Really. So you have to imagine that your insides of your intestines, while they do produce their own mucus to help keep things smooth and slippery, will be aided by having a little bit of fat to help things slide along the track. So. If you've already had enough water and enough fiber, the next thing I would recommend trying is making sure you have at least an avocado or some good coconut oil in your diet every day to help ease that transition. Some people find that if they have an electrolyte imbalance, they might not be able to poop as well. So salting your food can come in handy. If there isn't a reason for you not to add salt to your diet, you may find that the addition of sea salt will help with the electrolyte balance and then improve the quality of your poop. Absolutely. And then there's also um, like a plant-derived plant, it's a plant -derived mineral supplement that um, I take um, that Dr. Wallach created. And it's, trace, it's all like 77 trace minerals. There so talk, talking about electrolytes, yes. it's like that's... Um, an amazing supplement for for helping the body, you know, get all the electrolytes it needs. Right, because when we think about electrolytes, one of the first things I think about is muscle tone. And so, like we were describing the peristaltic movement of the GI tract, if you're out of balance with your electrolytes, it's very hard for you to have toned muscle and have a coordinated contraction, which can also contribute to constipation. So, like someone who doesn't have enough calcium or magnesium, their yeah. their gut wouldn't be moving healthfully. Right. And a lot of times what I notice with patients is the issue also includes a stress or anxiety component. Mm -hmm. If you haven't pooped in a couple days, you're already stressed out by it, so then it becomes even harder to calm down and relax enough to poop. And a few of those minerals you mentioned, like selenium and magnesium, calcium in addition, are all very important for relaxation, to so allowing the body to relax enough to let go of the sphincter so that you can actually poop when you're ready to. Right. Now, if you've tried all of these things and nothing's working for you, we do have things that we know tend to cause people to poop, right? Anybody ever hear of a prune smoothie, <laughs> right? So eating foods that are known to have a laxative quality can help. So prunes are a great one. Um, some people choose less ripe fruit. So sour apples can help the same thing, stimulating that movement. So if prunes aren't your cup of tea and you're looking for something that may be more of a quick fix, there are supplements that you probably have kicking around your house that can help you induce a bowel movement. Vitamin C is kind of my go-to because vitamin C is so good for your immune system and other aspects of your health that a little extra, although it may have the side effect of causing loose stool, which is what you're looking for if you're constipated, its positive benefits are far outweigh any harm that that loose stool could do for you. So if you can't get yourself to eat some prunes, you can always try taking mag um, So if you can't get yourself to eat some prunes, you can always try taking vitamin C about a gram at a time until the stool loosens, until you have soft stool. 
And once you get to that point, you can continue taking vitamin C at that dose or lower until such time as your bowel movements resume their normalcy. But then we talk about what's normal. What's a good normal for a bowel movement? If you're a naturopath, a good normal for bowel movement is 20 minutes after every meal you eat. So if you are a typical three meals a day, then you should poop three times a day. Now this gets a little wonky because most of us eat our dinner later in the evening and aren't up long enough for our digestion to fully take place and have to poop at night. So we start our day with a poop. And so you poop first thing in the day and then again maybe after lunch and then again after dinner if you're lucky. But for me, the lowest amount of poop that I think is healthy is once a day. Because like we were talking about, if things get backed up, you start almost recontaminating the system because it is a system that's meant to assist in detoxification. Right. So if you're not pooping once a day, you're constipated yes. and you're reabsorbing your toxins. That's not good. Right. Now, like we said, some medicines will change your ability to poop. And these are things that if you feel like once a day is your normal, check in with your ND, talk to somebody, make sure that that's healthy for you because the other thing we haven't quite gotten to yet is what does that poop look like? All right, so maybe your one poop a day is the perfect poop. What is the perfect poop? The perfect poop, everybody take a look at your arm, look at it from your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. That is about the length of your large intestine and that is about how long your poop should be. What? Right, so the ideal perfect poop is going to be one long, unbroken poop that's about the length of your forearm. Crazy. It is. It's really crazy. And if we did that once a day, then I wouldn't mind you pooping just once a day. Now, that poop, if it's that long, all right, great, what other qualities should it have? Well, what color is it? We talked about how if there's a backup of bile in the poop, the poop will get change in color. We said the skin will even change, right? So what color is that poop? Typically we say poop's brown, right? Well, there's many shades of brown and if you're a fan of Bob Ross, you know about how to make all of them. But if you're not, the color we're looking for is what he would call Van Dyke brown, but it's a nice, rich, dark brown, your favorite 70 plus percent chocolate bar brown, all right? You want it to be light enough that you can determine it's brown, not black but you don't want it so light that you might be tempted to call it coffee colored or caramel colored or any other of those lovely light brown or tan type colors. So your ideal poop is a nice deep rich dark brown. It does not sink or float so it shouldn't necessarily settle right to the bottom right away but it shouldn't float on the top either. It should have no undigested food particles. So if you look at your poop and you can identify something you've eaten in the last 24 hours, then something's going on with your digestive system. And it's a good idea to speak with your naturopath or a nutritionist, whoever you're comfortable with, and assess why it is your body isn't absorbing that food. Other things that you want to look out for are mucus, pus, so anything that's white in color, extra slippery or slimy, anything that's oily, so if you look in the toilet and there's an oil slick on the top of the toilet, that tells us that something's going on with your fat digestion and that's definitely worth examining. But if we have that perfect poop, it's that deep brown, it's that length that we discussed, it's going to sink to the bottom of the toilet by the time you've gotten a chance to look at it, and it's also going to be non-foul smelling. Now, we all know that poop has a scent. We're not trying to pretend like it's not going to smell like poop. But we all also know that on some days, poop smells way worse than on other days. When your bowels are regular, the smell of your poop is predictable and it's not usually noxious or offensive to you. If on a day that you find that your poop is particularly smelly or stinky, there's probably something worth examining in what you've consumed in the last 24 hours. So you have a long, dark brown, not smelly, not floaty, no chunks of food in it poop, what else is important about it? What else could there possibly be? Texture. You want to know about the texture of your poop. Now, if you've ever been prone to constipation, you might have what I've termed rabbit pellets, right? Where your poops are just tiny little pellet turds like M&Ms or raisins or something, right? So that's one texture. The ideal texture of a poop is going to be what we call plastic. 
That doesn't mean hard like plastic. It means it has that shiny molded look like plastic. So if you've ever played with Silly Putty, you know that when you stretch it, it looks dull, but when you let it sit and reform, it has a nice sheen to it. That's what we're talking about for poop. So we want it to have a nice plastic look. We want it to be well formed. So that means it looks like a snake. It's not lumpy, missing parts. It's not furry. You don't want it to fall apart on the edges or look like it has feathers or ruffles to it. And if me just talking about poop on the air isn't enough for you to really get a good picture of poop, you can go ahead and Google the Bristol stool chart. And the Bristol stool chart will show you photographic pictures. It takes you through type one through seven, one being the little rabbit poops that we talked about that are typical with somebody who's constipated and dehydrated, all the way up to seven, which we would all call like watery diarrhea. So poop that has no solid factor to it would be a seven. So the ideal poop in our world is a four or a five, which means it's well formed. If we're ideal, it's in one piece, but if it's perfect in every other way, but not in one piece, we go from a four to a five. So four is absolutely perfect, five is still acceptable in the perfect poop realm. Got it, so if we're between a four and a five, and we're doing that at least once a day, um, then we know that we're digesting, that we're, we're absorbing our nutrition, or at least this is an indication that we, that we are. Um, we know that we're hopefully digesting, absorbing our fat. Um, we know that we're not reabsorbing our toxins. We know that we're hydrated enough, that we're eating enough fiber. Um, so we are supporting our immune system. Right, so then the only other questions to ask really are kind of the basics. When we talk about what is healthy poop, how often do you go, which we covered, the consistency of your stool we talked about. What we didn't mention is how easy is it to pass and are you feeling as though you're completely evacuated, which would mean do you feel as though you've pushed all of the poop out of your body when you're done. Many people leave the bathroom after a bowel movement feeling as though they could still go. And if that's true for you, then that's worth further evaluation. Even though that poop might look perfect in the bowl, if you walk away from it feeling like you could still poop or you still have something unfinished to do, it's not the perfect poop. And then all poop should be easy to pass. While it is normal first thing in the morning for the initial stool to be a little bit harder because you've been sleeping and sucking the water out of it, once that initial stool begins to pass, the rest of the stool should be very easy. It should just kind of slide right out. If you're having to strain, force yourself, or your poop is interrupted into many little sessions, then these are all signs that there's something going on with your digestion that's worth looking at. So um, you, when you first came to my house, uh, observe that at every bathroom- Squatty potty. We have squatty potties at every toilet. Um, and you, I think you like yelled from the bathroom, squatty potty, we're gonna have to talk about this in the podcast. True, and I totally forgot. So another thing that can come in handy is your physical posture when you're attempting to poop. And there's not a lot of talk about it in Western medicine, but in Eastern medicine, they do describe a perfect poop posture. And that posture involves elevating the knees above the pelvis, just like we would if we were out in nature and chose to squat, to lean back with our heels on the ground. All right, so if you can recreate that position with your body, it aligns your bowels so that they are all headed towards the anus, the exit, right? The very last part of your bowel is called the sigmoid colon before it gets to your anus. And it's called sigmoid because it makes an S curve. All right, so the best thing we can do is to get gravity on our side, put our body in a position that aligns our bowels towards the exit. And then if you're really an overachiever, take a nice deep breath and bring your arms up over your head. And that's the king of all pooping positions. So knees, knees elevated. So that's why you get the squatty potty and there'll be a link to the squatty potty in the show notes along with um, some additional information that Heidi's given me about um, healthy poops and how to get them. And the, the, that, that chart, the Bristol scale, the Bristol scale, that'll be in the show notes of the podcast. Um, so the, the perfect position is sort of like you're squatting and your hands are up in the air like you're at a Tony Robbins event, <laughs> taking a deep breath and smiling and going, yes, yes, yes. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. <laughs> Have a healthy poop. Yes. Excellent. Terrific. Well, um, are there any supplements that you would recommend people just have on hand or take 
to ensure uh, just overall health, but, but, but to have a continuous healthy poop. So we talked about how important mineral balance is. And so having a product that includes electrolytes, vitamins and minerals is wonderful to have on board. Other things that are really important, especially in our house, we have calcium and magnesium supplement. For me, I know my diet, I know what I intake, and usually if I'm having any difficulty, it's usually stress related. And for me, what I do is I take a dose of my calcium magnesium supplement, and that helps me to stay regular. Other things that are important are things that just support a healthy digestive system. So we mentioned having good fat. Fish oil is always a wonderful addition to have healthy fat in the diet. Another thing may be repopulating the gut with its natural flora. Many of us have had times in our lives where we've had to take a medication like an antibiotic or an antifungal that will kill off the normal flora in our gut. So while it got rid of that pesky sinus infection, it also took away all the good stuff that's been helping you process your food. In those cases, it's also helpful to repopulate with a high dose probiotic. Most of us will take a probiotic for the rest of our lives if we're not eating a ton of cultured food. Awesome, well you know what, I actually just had Dr. Megan on the show, we talked about kombucha and cultured foods and I just, I love sauerkraut so I've been eating lots of sauerkraut, feeling good about that. Yes, and um, if you're wondering about cultured, we also call it fermented foods. Yes. So like you're saying, the sauerkraut's everybody's mm -hmm. most notable one. But I recommend listening to that podcast, taking a look at the literature on what else is available for fermenting because kimchi is wonderful. Like you're mentioning, kombucha is easy enough to do at home. Or so kefir, if you and you don't. Uh, what I thought was interesting is you don't need to make kefir with um, dairy because I'm I'm dairy freak. So I'm sensitive to dairy, but you can do it. You can get kefir seeds and make it with coconut or almond milk, or I think it's more co common with coconut. Um, but yeah, I thought that was really cool. You can even get cultured coconut, um, like yogurt. You can. So or almond, like you get cultured almond yogurt-like substance. Um, so, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so if you're not um, somebody who is very well versed in the natural foods world and all of this talk of cultured and fermented is a little intimidating to you, if you just start with the basics, something that's familiar to you, such as sauerkraut is easy enough. If you're less adventurous so far as your food is concerned and you're not willing to go far beyond the sauerkraut route, kombucha is not an interesting beverage for you, then I would recommend just taking a probiotic supplement and at least getting the bacteria in in a way that it can be beneficial to you and your pooping process. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Heidi Samani. Um, I know that after listening to you, everyone is going to have um, perfect poops from now on and we're all going to feel better. And I know that um, as a result of listening to naturopaths, I have, my entire family has great poops and we all notice a difference in our mood. So my challenge to all of you is follow Dr. Heidi's advice uh, for better pooping. Um, so just to wrap things up, do you have anything else to share before we finish uh, today's show? I do. There are a few things that you should remember when it comes to your healthy poop. And we talked about the squatty potty as an addition to your home to get that perfect position. But the other thing is, the routine around poop. I know it's difficult if you have small children in the house, but closing the door, leaving your phone behind, and having just a couple of minutes that you actually dedicate to the activity at hand can be helpful in setting up your nervous system for success. Another thing is if you've gone through all of these steps and nothing seems to be helping, please do contact your physician because it may be an underlying hormonal problem or other upset that could be contributing to your constipation. And not everything is digestive related even though it is involved with the digestive system. Other systems do participate in our ability to poop. And the last thing I would like to mention is that with all of the food sources we have for fiber, for the ones that we've talked about and for others that you can find online, it is worthwhile to pursue food as your fiber option over a supplement for fiber. If you are desperate for fiber and you cannot consume enough in a day to meet your 25 gram minimum, then it is acceptable to use a psyllium husk or other gentle fiber supplement, but it should not be something you are dependent upon for your poop. And speaking of dependent upon, um, Dr. Wallet created a herbal laxative um, called Herbal Rainforest. Uh, it's a longevity supplement. Um, tastes really good. It will absolutely make you go. Um, but he warns to not take it for more than seven days and not take any herbal laxative or any laxative for that matter 
for more than seven days because um, he says that your body can become addicted and, and, and to become dependent upon needing the stimulation of a laxative in order to go, uh, which is scary. It really is. And most of those laxatives, if you're their herbal, will have something called senna root in them. And senna is a very strong laxative, but it's also one of the ones that we are most prone to becoming dependent upon. And basically, if you think about it like telling a small child to clean their room, if you wake up every morning and you tell them clean your room, every morning they will follow your instruction and clean your room. And then what happens the day that you're not there to tell them to clean the room? It doesn't get done. And that's basically what happens when we start influencing the body with a laxative. It's like somebody else knocking on the door and telling you what to do, and so your body evacuates the bowels when it's told by the laxative, and then it stops thinking for itself. And so the nervous system in our guts is very, very closely related to our brain. And as much as our brain does for us, when somebody else wants to take over a job, it'll let them. So if some of that gut nervous system can be ignored for a little bit because we're putting in a laxative and it doesn't have to think about when to poop, the body's gonna take the easy way. It's going to allow that to happen. So that's why we recommend using laxatives very sparingly and only when you're absolutely needy. And from in my realm of when do I prescribe gentle laxatives, it's usually if somebody hasn't pooped consistently for like three day time periods. So if they're only pooping once every three days and they're making all the dietary changes that they need to make while we're working on it, we might use a gentle laxative, non-stimulating laxative so that we can help encourage the poop and get the pattern because the body loves a pattern. Got so it. If you do it regularly and make it part of your routine, give yourself the time, use your squatty potty, yeah. much more likely to be successful and leave with a smile on your face. <laughs> Excellent. And for those who have diarrhea, they should also drink lots of water, get electrolytes, use a squatty potty, get lots of fiber um, because that is, can also help them regulate. Is there anything just for, that you would do differently just for people who have diarrhea? Um, well, diarrhea, because it can have so many other causes, it can be something that's very transient, just a 24-hour period. So I wouldn't change too many of those recommendations because we're still trying to promote healthy gut function. If your diarrhea persists for more than 24 hours at that point, you do need to seek medical advice because it is not natural for our body to make just liquid poop. If it's liquid poop for too long, then other things that might be going on are your nervous system could be too turned on, too amped up, and so things are just moving too quickly through. The muscles are all excited and just squishing everything through before anybody has had a chance to pull out the nutrients it needs. Um, yeah, the other thing that does come into play with both constipation and diarrhea is hemorrhoids. So it is something to consider why we say don't ever strain at stool, just make sure there's time in your day for it so that you can have your routine because when we increase pressure in our pelvic area, we increase pressure on all of those blood vessels. And the blood vessels that are in our anus are very susceptible to becoming backed up or becoming engorged with blood. And they take longer to drain if we're not pooping regularly. So that muscular function helps with moving the poop, but it also helps moving the blood through the venous system in the pelvis. So straining at stool or having too many stools in a row, so like watery stool with diarrhea, can irritate those blood vessels and cause hemorrhoids. Now, hemorrhoids can be internal, which just usually itch and they don't tend to bleed too much, or they can be external, which people will notice when they wipe. Either they'll see some fresh blood when they wipe away their stool, or they'll notice pain or itching when they try to wipe. And all of those things are worth taking a look at and having a doctor check out because it means that whatever the issue is, it's been going on long enough or it's severe enough to cause other systems to become involved, in this case, the cardiovascular system. Wow. Yes, we definitely want, if you have any kind of symptoms, you definitely want to handle it now before it gets worse. Absolutely. Constipation yeah. and diarrhea are things that on their own can be handled, but when paired up with other symptoms, those, that's the body tapping you on the shoulder saying, hey, it's not just this. So if you're straining at stool, your stool has become hard, it's been a couple days since you've had ease of bowel movement, and then you add in a little bit of blood every time you wipe, then you know that this issue has not started to resolve itself. It's moving in the other direction, and it's time to pay attention, get some assistance with it. Yeah. 
thank you so much for coming on the show, talking about something we all do and we all need to pay attention to, our poop. Absolutely. Everybody in my world has listened to a talk or two on poop because it is truly something when done well can be life changing. Excellent. Well, you've just changed all of our lives. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are you looking to optimize your health? Are you looking to get the best supplements at the lowest price? For high quality supplements and to talk to someone about what supplements are best for you, go to takeyoursupplements.com and one of our fantastic true health coaches will help you pick out the right supplements for you that are the highest quality and the best price. That's TakeYourSupplements.com TakeYourSupplements.com That's TakeYourSupplements.com Be sure to ask about free shipping and our awesome referral program.